And I think it reflects back to chapter 1, verses 9 through 11 that Steve read about the uh, poor brother and the rich brother. Now, it doesn't say rich brother in chapter 1, and there is some doubt in James about when the rich are referred to if they're believing rich or if they're simply unbelieving rich because in our, our section, it's going to talk about that the rich uh, blaspheme the beautiful name that you bear, which means obviously these rich people aren't Christians. Now, it's hard sometimes to tell. I think in chapter 1 they are, I think in chapter 2, they're not, and I think in chapter 5, they're not. What James is doing is very rabbinical, but you don't, you don't pick up on it because you're not used to listening to rabbis. They would, we call it pearls on a string. It means jumping from one subject to another to keep people's attention, but coming back to the same subject later. So really, chapter 2, 1 through 13, is an expansion of chapter 1, 9 through 11. And if you see that, I think you can see how this fits. I would outline this uh, this way. Chapter 2, 1 through 7, deals with the ways that this age thinks about things, the way that this age deals with people. But verses 8 through 13 deals with the ways that the new age, the new kingdom, the messianic age deals with people. And so it's a contrast. It's a comparison. Don't do it this way, which you are doing it, it, James would say. Do it this way that Jesus taught us. And I think when you see that contrast in comparison, it will make it easier. Now, he starts off this section again, my brothers. Now, the reason he's doing that, he's going to do it in, in verse 1, verse 5, verse 14. He's going to do it in chapter 3, 1. He's going to do it again in chapter 5, verse 7. The reason he's called them my brothers all the way through here is he is devastating them with what he says. So he slaps them in the face and says, my brother, my brother. And uh, it's kind of the way I think he keeps this thing moving to show he loves them. He calls them brother. Then he just lowers the boom on what they're doing to people. Now, look at your Bibles, please. I'm using a Williams translation, and my, mine says, My brothers, stop trying to maintain. Now, do you have the word stop in your translation? The reason this is here is that this is a very special construction that means stop an act already in process. He's not saying don't ever do this. He's saying stop doing this. They were showing worldly distinctions among one another, and James is uh, commanding them to stop. Now, it says stop trying to maintain your faith. Now, there are two ways we look at the word faith in the New Testament. From Jude, chapter, from Jude verse 3, the word faith can be used for a body of Christian doctrine. The faith once and for all delivered unto the saints. But the other use of the word faith that I think is here means our faith relationship with Jesus, our trusting relationship with him. And I think that's got to be what it means here. Now, there's a wonderful little phrase here, but it's very difficult to understand. And what I would like is for several of you to read me this phrase after I read you mine. For those of you who may have an interlinear here, this is a series of genitives. It's just a piling up of the, of the, of the, of the. And here's my translation. Faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, mine has the glorious presence of God on earth. Now, I want some of the others of you to read me your translation and tell me what it is that this little phrase is in yours. Somebody, please. The Lord of glory. The Lord of glory. What translation is that? King James, the Lord of glory, okay? Someone else? Is there a revised standard version here? Someone have RSV? Anybody? Uh, yeah, it has our Lord Jesus Christ, and then it comes right back and says the Lord of glory, right? Now, in the Greek text, there's only one Lord, kurios, and that's our Lord Jesus Christ. What they're assuming is that, that this word glory is in apposition to Lord, and they're just putting the word Lord back in twice, but it's really not there. Somebody else give me it, what, your translation. Is there another translation here? Who reigns, Who reigns in glory. That's very interesting. What translation is that? That's New, English. New English. Who reigns in glory. Now, you catch Williams is trying to say our, the presence of our glorious Lord on earth. Now, 
It's a series of genitives, which means we usually translate genitive as of. And there's been a lot of question about what this means. What is the of glory? Well, I think there are several ways we could go, and these different translations have shown us the way different committees have understood this. We could say that it's talking about uh, uh, God here, that we're saying our Lord Jesus Christ, the glory. And of course, for a Jew, and this is a very Jewish book, to hear the glory, it would go back to what? The Old Testament and where God is called by the rabbis. Now, it doesn't appear in the Bible, the title, but they called him the Shekinah glory. Now, the word Shekinah is Hebrew for to dwell with. And so that wonderful cloud that symbolized the presence of God was known as the Shekinah glory. Now, there are some passages in Exodus, I think it's 16.10, and some in, I think it's 2 uh, Chronicles 7, where God is described as the glory. And that may be it. In Acts chapter 7, verse 2, again, God is described by the word glory. And so it obviously becomes a title for deity. So I really think what's happening here is it happens all the way through the New Testament. The, Old Te the New Testament writers go back into the Old Testament and find a title for God and apply that title to Jesus. This is very similar to the opening of the book of James where God the Father and God the Son are put in a grammatical relationship that shows their equality. I think it's another way. That may be a kind of a subliminal way in the sense of, of us understanding the way the, 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 the original is, but I think it's, it's referring to God in Christ. And that's why William says the glorious presence of God on earth. Or we would put this way, the incarnate presence of God. And so I think it's an affirmation of the deity of Christ. And I've given you all the uh, verses there in your notes you can look at. Now he's saying, stop trying to, to, to maintain your faith in, in God in Christ and show acts of partiality. Now these acts of partiality, this is going back, to, again, it's very Jewish, to an Old Testament concept. When a man would come before a judge in the Old Testament, what the Old Testament told that judge not to do well, a person would come before a judge and he would have his head bowed like this. The judge was not, now here's a little phrase in Hebrew, was not to lift the face. Why? Because lifting the face would mean the judge recognized who it was. A family member, an influential person, a wealthy person, a favored person. So the, the, they were not to see who it is to make the judgment. Now that's what we have here. We can't be making distinctions among visitors that come into our church. Now, I think the rich man and the poor man are both visitors, non-Christians, and they're coming in to hear more about God. And so we can't show acts of favoritism based on worldly standards to people who are coming to our meetings. That's what this is talking about. Now, there are several references in Deuteronomy to this, and I don't think they're in your notes, so I'll give them to you quickly. I hope you'll write them down so you can look them up later about this idea of lifting the face as a way of showing acts of partiality. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 17. Deuteronomy 10, 17. Deuteronomy 16, 19. Deuteronomy 24, 17. A couple more. Leviticus 19, 15. That wonderful passage about Cornelius and Peter. Uh, Acts 10, 34. And I would add here, I think uh, Paul's summary statement in Galatians 3, verse 28, is very important, where it says there's no more Jew, there's no more Greek, there's no more slave, there's no more free, there's no more man, there's no more woman. We are all one in Jesus Christ, which means that every distinction that men put up between themselves, God in Christ has removed. Put it another way, you've heard in a cliche, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. God does not look with partiality. He just sees people made in his image. So if God's that way, then God's children should be that way. Now look at verse 2. We have an if here. If a man, this is a third class conditional sentence that says this could possibly happen. It doesn't really mean it did happen. This is kind of like he's making, it's not a parable per se, but he's making a hypothetical situation. Let's say this did occur. 
that on one day a very wealthy person, well known, obviously a wealthy, came to your meetings, and at the same time a street person with all the accoutrement sights and sounds of both came to your meeting at the, at the exact same time. Now, he describes this little example of what it means. Now, the word gold ring here means gold-fingered. And uh, we know in the ancient world that a gold ring was a sign of wealth, and many times they, they wore more than one of them. And we often know that you could rent a gold ring for a really big party. So you can catch kind of the status symbol of this gold ring, right? So here comes a man, and he's, he must kind of walk in like this, you know. <laughs> Check me out, right? So he has these gold rings on. And he's dressed in bright, shining clothes, uh, meaning, you know, the, the expensive kind of bright clothes. And notice here, now watch your translations. I want you to look at the marginal note or any kind of thing it might say. Do you have the translation, your meeting, your assembly, or do some of you have your synagogue? Anybody have synagogue? What translation? New American. It is the word synagogue, surprisingly enough. Now, I think that James is a very early book where believers are still meeting in a, in a uh, context of unbelieving Jews. So I think synagogue is quite appropriate. A matter of fact, in that famous passage in uh, Hebrews 10.25, where it says, do not neglect the assembling of yourselves together, that's another form of this very same word, synagogue, together, together. And so I think it does reflect a very early time before the synagogue and the church split comes into your synagogue. At the same time, a poor man clad in dirty clothes. You can almost uh, see them now. It's standing at the back door. And you pay special attention to the man who wears fine clothes. And you say to him, Oh, oh, it's, we're just so glad to have you. That's, that's a paraphrase. Uh, <laughs> sit here in this very special place. You know, sit up front. Here's my stool. Use my hymnal. You know. Now, one reason I think this is a synagogue is this is a place of honor. And folks, the Jewish synagogue had places of honor. They had seats reserved for the, for the wealthy, powerful leaders. And that's what I think we're referring to here. And this other guy comes in, you say, uh, sit over there, brother. <laughs> and the implication here is sit at my feet. There's no chair for you, so just kind of scoot over in the corner and for goodness sakes, don't say anything. Catch, the, catch what's happening? Yes, it's worldly distinctions here. James comes right back and says, verse 4, Do you not make improper distinctions among yourself and prove to be critics with evil motives? Not the people that came in, not the rich man, the poor man, the people in the church, the people in the synagogue are acting uh, different ways toward them. Now, Jesus died for both of them. Jesus loves both of them. The one who's most likely to respond is the poor man, but this group of believers is pampering the wealthy and persecuting the poor. Now, he says, and you're, you have evil motives when you do that. Look at verse 5. The word is an imperative. Listen up. That's kind of what they would think when, with that. Listen up now. Imperative. Listen now. Take, take note of this. My dearly loved brothers, has not God... Three things are said about the poor. Very important. Has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith? Now, I think that this... Uh, Poor, this is a very interesting thing. I do think that God loves all people. It's not just poor people uh, that are saved, of course. But the majority of people in the early church were poor people. Because poor people have no resources on which to lean. And when they hear a message like this, they're so open. But sometimes when we do have resources and we feel like they're somehow threatened, it's very hard. The Bible says it's hard for a rich man to be saved. Well, look at the Matthew 19 passage, which parallels the Mark 10 passage from this morning. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. That's an that's a oriental hyperbole, an overstatement, meant to shock you than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And so here, here we have James kind of locking this down. So God has chosen the poor. Does that mean God has not chosen the rich? No. Does that mean God chose every poor person to be saved? No, we're reading too much in it. But what he is saying is that God wants the poor people in his family. Now, the other side, I think, here is when it says God has chosen the poor, isn't it one of the characteristics of the Messianic age, going back to Isaiah 61, that the gospel will be preached to the poor? Remember when John the Baptist asked of Jesus, are you really the Messiah or should we expect another? And Jesus said, go tell him, gospel is preached to the poor, is one of the evidences. So throughout the Bible, this kind of thing is done over and over. Let me give you a few references if I can 
find where I have those here. Yes, this is just in the Gospel of Luke. You might want to see this. Luke chapter 1, verses 51 through 53. Luke chapter 4, verse 18. And Luke 7, 22 would all be examples of this evidence of God's new age has come when the poor are welcomed and accepted because they had been excluded in Judaism because, quote, in Judaism, wealth was a sign of God's favor and poverty was a sign of laziness or God's judgment, and therefore it was the wealthy uh, who were considered to be blessed. This is totally changing that. It is the poor of this world to be rich in faith and to possess, inherit... Oh, you might want to see 1 Peter 1, 4. Oh, how we're going to inherit those things. Or 1 Peter 3, 9, inherit the kingdom. You know, I've never heard a sermon on the kingdom of God, really. Isn't that surprising? But every one of Jesus' sermons was about the kingdom of God. Every one of Jesus' parables the kingdom of God is likened to. What is this kingdom of God? It's so hard to talk about because Jesus said the kingdom of God is near you, it's in your mouth. But at the same moment, it's something future. I think it's better to hold it in tension. It's the reign of God in men's hearts now that will one day be consummated over all the earth. In the Lord's Prayer, that's what we call the Lord's Prayer, Matthew 6, where it says, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, is a prayer for the kingdom of God to come among men. And so this idea of the poor are going to be a part of the messianic kingdom. The poor are going to sit down at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's this idea of being included in the family of God. The new age, the poor, are going to be there. And now it says, which he promised to those who love him. This is kind of tricky, but if you turn back over to chapter 1, verse 12, you see this same kind of little phrase, to those who love him. The truth is, I think this is going back to Deuteronomy. Uh, where it talks about uh, the Ten Commandments, those who love God will keep them. So I really think this idea about uh, promise to those who love him is a Jewish idiom of saying, if you love God, you're going to keep the commandments. And so it's a way of referring to covenant obedience, though it's kind of hard to tell uh, uh, in English if you don't pick up on that metaphor. But look at verse 6. It has the word you emphatic, but you in contradistinction, but you... In contrast, have humiliated the poor man. And listen to what he says. Are not the rich men... Now, if this is before A.D. 70, and I think it is, this may refer to the Sadducees, the very wealthy aristocrats, the status quo political group that was working with Rome to control Palestine. Maybe that's who it's referring to. Can't be certain, but that's a possibility. Uh, are not the rich men those who oppress you? Now, this word oppress is a word that is used... The only place it's used in the Bible is used in Acts chapter 10, verse 38, for Satan himself oppressing the people of God. Don't they oppress you and drag you into court? Are, are not they the ones who scoff at the beautiful name you bear? And I think we need to see that these questions are expecting a yes answer. Uh, they're structured that way to expect a yes, a yes answer. Now, what does it mean, drag you to court? Maybe you can't pay your bills, and they sue you and take your land or make you become an indentured servant, which is a way that Jews paid off their debts. What about this, uh, the beautiful name you bear? I think in your notes there are several scriptures. I'd like for you to look at your notes for a minute. Literally, it means called over you. Now, there are several possibilities. Number one, it could refer to the patriarchal blessing of Genesis 48, 16, where Jacob, before he died, blessed every one of the children. It could refer to a wife taking a husband's name. Isaiah 4, 1 is one example of that. It could refer to a baptismal formula, baptized in Jesus' name, Matthew 28, 19, Acts 2, 38, the name of Jesus. Or it could refer to an Old Testament title for the people of God, like Deuteronomy 28, 10. Uh, whatever it refers to, it is obvious these rich people are making fun or somehow uh, blaspheming this name. And is, is it the name Christian? Is it the name, uh, name of Jesus? Whatever it is, I don't know. But to me, it's obvious they are not believers. They're making fun of the, these people who believe. Now, in verse 8, it says, if you really observe. Now, this verse 8 and verse 9 should have an if in your Bible. These are both first-class conditional sentences which in the mind of the writer are assumed to be true for the sake of argument. Now, they're not true in reality, but they're true for the, for the building of his case. 
So as many times they can be translated since that, and, and, make, and make a real good sense to us. Now, verse 7, excuse me, verse 8. For if, with the implication it really is happening, if you really observe the law of the king. Now, that is so interesting. If you look at this, there are several places right here in James that this same law is talked about. Look back up in chapter 1, verse 25. It's called the law that makes men free. Look at uh, chapter 2, verse uh, 12. It's called the law that treats them as free. Now, I think that this is the same law. What law is this? Well, we're going to use the Ten Commandments here, and so we, we couldn't say it's something different from the Old Testament, but it looks to me like it's the law of the new age. It'd be very similar to what I think the uh, Sermon on the Mount is doing. Matthew 5, 6, and 7. It's talking about the characteristics of a kingdom man. It's talking about how we ought to treat each other in this new age of knowing the Messiah, in this new time of God reigning in our hearts. And so this law that makes men free and this law of the king is this new gospel that Jesus is preaching about no partiality and love your neighbor as yourself and love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. It's those kind of emphasis that are being made in this royal law. And then he quotes uh, Leviticus 18, 19. I mean, excuse me, Leviticus 19, 18. And I think Leviticus uh, uh, 19, 15 fits right into what we're talking about, the poor being persecuted by the wealthy. So he picks up this on love your neighbor as yourself. I want to take one little aside here and just say this to you. I feel like one of the real problems of America is that we have such poor self-images about ourselves because we're thrust in this performance mold and everybody can't be successful in a society. It's not, it's just can't, everybody just can't be. And if we're, we only get our self-worth from our performance, then that we, if that's the only thing you have to, to uh, like yourself about, then you really get into a problem. May I say to you, when the scripture says you must love your neighbor as yourself, is a kind of a backdoor way of saying there is an appropriate self-love. We've got to thank God for what he's doing in our lives and be grateful. There are some folks who have such poor self-images that I don't want them to love me the way they love themselves. Yuck, they would beat me up or hit me over the head or something. No, we need to have a positive sense of who we are in Jesus Christ and then treat others as we'd like them to treat us. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. I think that's really important. This is only part of, Jesus usually summarizes the Ten Commandments by quoting this Leviticus 19 and by quoting Deuteronomy 6 about loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But in this context, James just needs to make use of this one. Then in verse 9, But since you are showing partiality, you are committing sin. Now, he's just really coming up and saying the way you're treating people is absolutely breaking the law. They would say, no, we don't break the law. He would say, yes, you do, because you are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. Now, this word is a special word that means to step over a line, to, to see a boundary, to know you shouldn't cross this fence, but cross this fence anyway. They were knowingly sinning, not ignorantly sinning by the way they were treating each other. They knew in their hearts it was wrong to say, sit here, wealthy brother, sit here, street person. They knew they were convicted by that, but they went ahead and did it. Now, look at what it says. For whoever obeys the whole... I want to say to you before I read verse 10, this is one of the most significant verses in the whole New Testament about the Old Testament law. The other one, I want you to write it right here in your Bible. You need these two to go together. The other one is Galatians 3, 15 through 19. Gal write that in the margin if you don't have a reference Bible. Right here by verse 10, Galatians 3, uh, 15 through 19. This is so powerful. And if you're trying to be, and I really believe, and I'm going to try to stir you up, so just don't throw anything. I really believe you can be saved by works. We'll let it sink in a minute. Okay. If you keep all the law from bar mitzvah to death and you never break one, one time, you can go to heaven. But if you break one law, one time, the way is permanently closed. And Paul would say that all of us have done one, at least one, right? So, and I think what we're saying, man wants to be right with God, God gave him away. But the problem is man couldn't do it. 
Man couldn't perform what God gave him. So all men are in need. So if they don't love their brother, they would say, well, we don't kill, we don't steal, we're, we're pretty good. And James says, the way you treated that poor man shows me that you're a sinner. Because if you break the law one time by showing partiality, which Deuteronomy says you can't show, and you showed it to that man, you just broke the law, and you're guilty before God. It's a powerful Jewish argument. Now, what, what in our day, what we tend to do is say, well, listen, man, I go to church and I tithe and I do all this stuff and I witness. I got this little problem in my life, but it's just this one little area, just this one little thing. I do all this other stuff so well, surely. No. Partial compliance is not what we're talking about. You see, you can't have this little area over here. If you have this little area, it negates the whole thing. I think this is really important. You can't have everything going and, ha and have other things happening. It's just, it just won't work. Some obedience is not enough. Mm. We have to work on all. Now, I think it's uh, interesting then in verse 11. For he who says, you must not commit adultery, also said, you must not commit murder. And if you commit adultery, but you do not commit murder, you are still a lawbreaker. You must continue talking and acting like people who are to be judged. Now, what does that mean? You know, when I hear, and boy, there's such sharp preachers out there. Holy moly, there's some uh, intellectual folks. And they just make things so logical and they seem so enthused. You're going, whoa, what, whoa. Friends, one way you know who speaks the truth is not only the content of their message, is it biblical, but does their lifestyle match what they preach? By their fruits ye shall know them. If we proclaim something, we have to live it. Amen? That's true of all of us. Our walk and our talk has to be the same. That's what it's talking about. Continue walking and talking like people. If you teach it, you live it. Now, this little thing about who are to be judged. I don't know if I gave you all the verses or not. Let me see. I have some extra ones, I think, here. Yes. You may want to put in your notes these extra ones because I'm going to talk about, and here's another uh, example I think is somewhat controversial in the church, but I'll give you the, my scripture references and let you look it up. I believe Christians are going to stand before God in judgment. Want to get your pencil out? 2 Corinthians 5.10 is a classic passage. We shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. But here are two others. Matthew 25, 31 and following is the great white throne judgment, the sheep and the goats. And then Romans 2, verse 6 and 16. Now, I really think that Jesus Christ's blood cleanses from all sin. So if I'm really cleansed, and my sin has really been forgiven and washed away and is white as snow and is gone and God's not going to bring it back, then what in the world am I going to stand before God for? I think we're going to give an account of some of this kind of stuff. Some of our bad attitudes. Some of our uh, lack of love. Uh, maybe the use of our spiritual gifts, our availability to God's service. I think Judgment Day is going to be a wonderful and horrible day for the people of God. I think we're going to be so happy because we see the Lord, we're going to have a new body, the Lord's going to affirm us, but at the same time, we're going to see people who because of our acts of unlove have not come to Christ. Because of sin in our lives, they were turned away. Because we fail to witness to them, they do not know the Master. Loved ones, family members who we were nervous about sharing with, and now they're eternally doomed because we didn't speak or we spoke ugly, critically, and judgmentally, and because of that, they didn't come to the Master. I think we're going to have a lot of tears on Judgment Day as well as a lot of joy. I think we're going to stand before Christ. And apparently, James is referring to how Christians treat visitors, you mean that uh, we're going to be held accountable for the, how we treat the rich man versus how we treat the poor? I heard a, uh, Walter Kaiser, who teaches at uh, Trinity Seminary, was saying in a sermon I listened to, he said, you know, there's going to be two lines in heaven. And uh, he said, if you see a line that has a lot of preachers and teachers in it, get in the other line because every sermon is reviewable. <laughs> if you see me in line, would you come stand with me, please? <laughs> now... Notice verse 13, then I'm through. The merc for merciless judgment will be the portion of the merciless man. 
Now, this is not saying that we're saved by showing appropriate attitudes because that would be salvation by works. And I don't think we're saved by works, but i tell you what I do think. I think once we're saved, we ought to start taking on the family characteristics of daddy, meaning God, instead of daddy, meaning the devil. I think our life is going to show who we know. I think it's it, James, I mean, uh, 1 John says it so well. How can you say you, you love God whom you haven't seen and you hate your brother whom you have seen? There's, you're a liar, John says. So how we treat others shows how we've been treated. Uh, I think that the, the verse right after the Lord's Prayer, which would be uh, Matthew 6, 13, and 14, is so scary, it ought to blow your socks right off. Just ought to blow your socks. We always quote the Lord's Prayer, and we never quote the next verse after it. Oh, it's scary, 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 and I'll let you look it up. <clears throat> I'll give it to you, though. Here, here's someone I think you ought to read. Matthew 6, 14, and 15. Matthew 7, 1 through 5. Matthew 18, verses 22 through 35. My friends, the way we treat others is the way God's going to treat us. What does that mean? That doesn't mean if I'm merciful, God will save me and have mercy, but it means this. If I come to know Jesus Christ and I've been forgiven everything, but I hold things against my brother and I judge my brother and I show acts of partiality, God's going to look at me and say, you know, friend, you just didn't get it, did you? I accepted you with all your faults and you won't accept anybody. The, the beautiful picture is if we show mercy, we're going to have mercy shown to us. And I want to tell you the truth. I don't want judgment. I, I don't want justice. Do you? Deliver me from justice. I want mercy. And as I treat others in mercy, it's a sign that God has and will treat me with mercy. I think that's an important, important passage. Well, this is the end of uh, uh, our section tonight. I think there are several things here we have to confront in our personal lives, not just in our church, but I think those who know we are Christians, I think how we treat people out in the workplace is very important. I think how we treat people who serve us, maybe it's somebody who helps us with the lawn, maybe it's somebody who comes to the house to repair our appliances, maybe it's somebody who carries out our groceries, uh, maybe on and on it could go. Folks, how we treat people we meet somebody who's rich and powerful, how, how do we act? And we, read, we meet the paper boy, how do we act? My friend, we need to act the same. We need the love of Jesus flow through us without making improper distinctions. Because I tell you the truth, everything in this world is going to burn up and pass away except what we've done for Christ. Everything. Lord, it is so easy to sit here and open the pages of a book. It's so hard to walk out these doors and live it. But I pray the power of the Holy Spirit would give us, Lord, the, the fortitude, the sensitivity, the commitment to walk in what we believe. God, forgive us for showing partiality. God, forgive us that sometimes we play games with this little sin versus that little sin. Father, let the person of Jesus flow through us that others might know you and be drawn into your kingdom. Let the face of Christ shine through our faces and forgive us, Lord, when we're ugly with people, when we're judgmental or critical. Give us, we pray, that supernatural love that can only come from you to see people with your eyes people for whom you died, people that you love. Change our worlds and change it through us. In Jesus' name, amen. We always believe whenever the Bible is read that there is a potential for God drawing people to himself. You have had a witness tonight in baptism. You have had wonderful message in songs. You have had the Bible open and taught. What is God saying to you? You're not here by accident. It's not by chance the Lord put on your heart to come tonight. What was in this lesson for you? What did God want you to hear? Now, my friend, what are you going to do with it?